So I want you to think back and remember the details, the, the, the events, the people that all led and contributed to you becoming a Christ follower. Those people whom the Lord worked through, those who influenced you, those who shared with you, those who uh, poured into your life that ultimately led to you becoming a Christian, a Christ follower, one who is committed fully to Jesus Christ. For some, it, this may have occurred a long time ago. Uh, maybe you were a small child. Uh, that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that at all. I was I committed to following Christ when I was nine years old. Uh, maybe you're only recently become a Christian. Man, that's really exciting. Uh, let me say again, just welcome to the family. Uh, you pull up your chair to the table the same as everybody else uh, because of Jesus and through Jesus. And so we're really glad that you're here. Um, as you think about these things, do you remember specifically the people? That's what I want us to kind of think about for a moment. The people who were involved. The people whom God used. For me, my parents were instrumental and very influential in my life. They were Christ followers and did their best to show me what loving Jesus looks like. I had a childhood pastor named Carlton Burris who every week would stand and would preach the gospel and he would do his best to make it clear. And, and he taught me the gospel. And, and all of that worked through the, 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 the power of the Spirit of God to, to lead me to a place when I was nine years old to, to becoming a Christian, to responding by faith and with repentance to the invitation of Jesus. Regardless of the details, if you're a Christ follower, then someone somewhere shared this good news message with you. Somehow. It may have been many people involved, but sharing the good news of Jesus is how we create Christians. It's how it works. It's the plan from the beginning. It's the plan to this very day that God draws us to himself and then through his power turns us around and sends us out, working through our lives so that others would come and know the same saving power that has worked in our lives. Make no mistake, if you're a Christ follower, God's will for your life is to turn you around and use you and work through you so that others might come to know him in that same way. And if you're worried about that, you're thinking, well, you know, I don't think I have what it takes or I don't have the right credentials or anything like that. Listen, God specializes <laughs> in using broken people. I'm, for that, I'm very grateful. And uh, if, there, if you're thinking that God can't use me, I've got good news for you. <laughs> he showcases his power through people. And so um, no matter your past, no matter the current circumstances that you're living in now, God desires to use you. God desires to work through you so that together we would be known as a group of disciples who make disciples. That's what it's all about. That's our calling. That's why we're doing this series right now called Values Defined, because we're looking at the Word of God in order for it to shape our understanding of our identity and our activity. And so if you have your Bible today, we're in the book of John, so the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, New Testament, go to John chapter 1. Today we're looking at relational evangelism. And my prayer is that God would use this to encourage you, that he would use it to equip you, and that he would use um, this powerful message that comes from the word of God to do a work in our lives so that it would mold us together, so that we would be unified in our missional effort to live this out. Let's walk through the passage together. We're going to start in verse 43. So John chapter 1, verse 43. I would encourage you to leave your Bible open uh, because we're just going to kind of walk our way through this. But beginning with just that single verse, John 1, 43 says, the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Now we're going to pause right there because we have a very key foundational truth that we don't want to miss. And I don't have a lot of notes on the screen, but you can write this down. Christianity is all about following Christ. That's the invitation. Follow me. Come and follow. Excuse me. All right, follow me. 
It sounds simple enough, right? And it is. It's not meant to be complicated. But here's what we cannot miss. Here's the, the wonderful complexity of it. To follow him means that we have to actually go where he goes. It means that we go with him. Is that it, 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 it involves every part of who we are. Um, what we must internalize is that to be a Christian, to be a Christ follower, is something so much more than a single one-time act of faith. Now, it begins with a one-time act of faith, but that's only the beginning of what God wants to do in your life and through your life. Following Jesus is about becoming a life long disciple. And in this day, when we read the scriptures, just remember that this was a different time. This was a time when um, a rabbi, when he would approach and, and, and someone would become their disciple, that, that that invitation from a rabbi was huge. In fact, Jesus shows us a, a reverse picture because in this culture, rabbis didn't invite anybody. You had to come and, and plead your case so that, that, that you might follow them. But Jesus comes, he invites these individuals to become a disciple. What we can't miss is that invitation is an invitation to uproot your life, to receive a new mission, a new purpose, a whole new identity, one that is totally bound up with the identity, purpose, and mission of the rabbi. When he says, come follow me, that's a huge invitation. I fear that we miss the magnitude of it for sure. Just remember that following Jesus does not mean like on Facebook or TikTok, all right? He's not trying to, to, to develop a YouTube channel. You know, subscribe here for more. <laughs> Jesus wants to follow us to follow him with our whole life. It's a sad reality that, that for many, the, the, the label, the identity of Christian is something that really only impacts their life the one hour a week that they park their car at the church. And that can't be true of us, guys. That can't be. The invitation of Jesus is to become an, a full, committed follower that means that we follow him into a life of obedience. Now look at the next two verses. John 1, starting in verse 44. It says, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethesda. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, again, a couple of things. If you're taking notes, there's two things here I want you to write down. The first is this. Philip found Nathaniel. He found him. He went out and found him because he's putting on display the reality of what we've just talked about, that we're called to be a group of disciples who make disciples. Another way to say that is found people, find people. We're going to say it as many different ways as we can so that we can grab a hold of this and walk out of here remembering this truth that if Christ has impacted your life, that his desire is to use you to do the same for others. Found people, go find people. This is how it ought to be. Church, this is our plan. If we are going to grow, this is the plan. We are not after trying to just fill a room. We are after creating disciples. And so for us to do that means you must turn and go find people for the cause of Christ. We must be disciples committed to making disciples. The whole reason we're doing this series is right there. is so that we can have a clear understanding of both our identity and our activity. That these things work together. That we are called to be disciples making disciples. So here's your homework for this week. I'm going to shift just a little bit. Your homework this week. That person you thought about in the beginning of service when I said remember back to who contributed to you coming to Christ. Your homework is, if, if possible, to reach out to them. Maybe call them, send them a text. Go by and see them if that's a possibility. But reach out and just tell them thank you. Say thank you for letting the Lord work through your life. I'm telling you, that would be a great encouragement for them to hear for sure. But then, after that conversation, you go to the Lord and you pray, Lord, let me be that for someone else this week. Use me so that others can come to know you. So the first thing from this two verses I want you to see is that Philip found Nathaniel. Secondly, we see that Jesus is the fulfillment of Scripture. 
This is what the text tells us. So Philip, he comes and he states that he has found the one that Moses and the law and the prophets that they wrote about. This is another way of him saying to his friend, listen, the one whom the, old, the whole Old Testament points to, yeah, we found him. He's here. Now, he wouldn't have said that. That's not a direct quote because he wouldn't have said Old Testament because at that time, the New Testament was happening like in real time. And so it's a different understanding of things. But these are Jewish young men. And like any good Jewish boy, they would have grown up being immersed in the law, immersed in the, in the Torah and the law and the prophets and the writings and all these things. And so they would have grown up knowing a couple of things. One, that a Messiah had been promised. That God had made provision, had said, I will crush the head of the enemy. So they know a Messiah is coming. And then generation after generation, each one upon another has been living and waiting in anticipation of that promise coming true. Of that promise being fulfilled. And he's saying, hey, listen, the one that for so many centuries, the one who we've been waiting for, the one who just the promise of his coming has sustained us as a people, I found him. He's here. Make no mistake, Philip didn't understand everything there was to know about Christ. Not even close. But that didn't stop him from going out and finding his friend and telling him what had happened. You see, Philip, he didn't have all the answers. And, and likewise, you probably don't either. That's okay. But if Christ has made a difference in your life, that should be all the motivation we need to just go and share that. To go and be open. If Jesus has changed you, then we need to share about that. Now, when it says that Jesus is portrayed as the fulfillment of Scripture, that's so very important. Because if someone comes and they offer you or they try to teach you a, a, a version of Jesus or a, a, a Jesus that doesn't come in line with the Word of God, if they're selling you a message that is contradictory to what we find in the Bible, run. Because it's not true. We have a test of what is true. It is the Word of God. God does not reveal himself in any way that contradicts what has already been revealed in Scripture. And so we see Philip connecting the dots and saying the fulfillment is now here. Jesus is the one. Jesus is the, the, the beautiful picture of the sovereignty and the faithfulness of God woven together to bring us to this very moment. Now look and see how Nathaniel responds. If you get your Bible open, look at verse 46. This is what it says. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. Nazareth, really? <laughs> see, I, I have found that no matter where you are, that every place has a place where people say, can anything good come from there, right? And I have not been here long enough nor made near enough friends to start sharing what I think those places are here, okay? <laughs> um, but it's true. That, that there's always, from the dawn of time, people have organized themselves into groups and then looked down upon those who are not in those groups. This is the human nature. People are people. And so Philip comes full of excitement and passion. And what we see out of Nathaniel is a skeptical response, probably even a sarcastic response. And so if you're prone to respond with sarcasm, maybe Nathaniel is someone you can identify with. He says, is there anything good that can come out of that? And so in response to this message that Philip has, that he's so compelled to bring, a message full of passion and excitement that, that Philip feels so deeply about, his friend responds with that kind of response. And what does Philip do? He gets angry. He marches out of there. He says, well, never mind that. <laughs> no, he, he doesn't get angry. He doesn't get defensive. He really doesn't even offer a rebuttal at all. If you look at the text, it just says that he, he moved to come and see. Boy, guys, I love that. I think that is both a model for us and hopefully an encouragement to us 
That that's how we respond in the face of, of skepticism or, or sarcasm or whatever it is. That just come and see. We just make the choice to point to Jesus. You see, in this moment, Philip could argue about Jesus or try to help his friend get to Jesus. And he chose the latter. And that is what we must do as well. William Barclay is a commentator who said, the only way to convince people of the supremacy of Christ is to just confront them with Christ and let him do the work. And so Philip doesn't argue, he just says, come and see. Man, I hope that that encouraged you today. What people need most in this world is not a well-crafted PowerPoint. It's not a detailed answer for everything. They just need to see Jesus. They just need to meet him. But later on in the New Testament, Peter would write to the church and he would encourage the, the believers with this, that, that you ought to be ready to have an answer, to defend, to share, to explain why you have this hope, the hope that you have within you. That's Peter talking about apologetics, meaning a defense, an explanation, a, a reason. But for Peter and for us today, the context of of apologetics is always meant to just showcase Jesus. We're not really after winning arguments, we're trying to win people, win souls, bring them to Jesus because he's our only hope. And so if you're here today and you're worried that if you step out in faith and you begin to share your faith, that somebody's gonna confront you with a question you don't know, or they're gonna reject you, or look down on you, or belittle you because your, their Bible questions can't be answered. My encouragement to you is this, just point them to Jesus. You don't have to defend the Bible. It can stand on its own. It has stood the test of time. For 2,000 years, it has been rock solid. The Bible doesn't need us to defend it. What people need is for us to just showcase the difference that Christ has made in us. Just bring people to Jesus because that's what they truly most desperately need. So the question for us as a church is this, do we really believe? Do we truly believe that the answer for the brokenness that is rampant in our world is Jesus? Because if that's the case, if we believe that, then that has to change everything about how we live our life. It has to order our steps. It has to guide our decisions. It has to motivate us each and every day because there is a world around us that is spiraling, right? I don't have to convince you of this. There's a lot going on out there. It weighs on me. It weighs on me as a parent. I've got three little girls. You know, One day I'm going to launch them out into this world. And between now and then and then after that, here's what I feel like we're called to do. We're called to be a church. We're called to be the church who sees the mission of Christ as our number one priority so that that brokenness can be addressed by the only answer. The problem is sin. We've got to see that clearly. The answer is Jesus. We've got to be just as clear about that. Now, I want to clarify something. So what we see here is the phrase, come and see. I think it's a great model for us. It's a great encouragement to us, come and see. But remember this, guys, come and see is more than just come to church. For us, as we launch out of here in a minute, when we dismiss and we go, I, I mean, I do hope you invite people to church, for sure. But most fundamentally, what people need is not an invitation to this place, but an invitation to this person. They need to meet Jesus. We have missed the mark as a, the people of God if we fail to see that God has you right where you are on purpose, whether it be that class or that job or that neighborhood or that family. God has you where you are so that that particular circle of influence can be impacted with the good news of Jesus Christ. He wants you to bring them to Jesus. Now, my promise to you is this. If you bring them here, bring them to church, which is a good thing, Following Jesus is better together. That's how we were supposed to do it. If you bring them to this place, my commitment to you is this, to always preach the gospel, to do my very best each and every time we gather, to hold high Jesus and to make it just as clear as I can about what Jesus has done and what he's invited us into. And so that means you have my commitment that every time we are here, that your friend that you bring will hear the good news 
of Jesus Christ. And they will be given an opportunity of this is how you can respond. This is how you can take your next step. But I promise you, what God wants to do is to take that same message that will be preached here and through your life showcase it to the world around you. He wants to use you to show the difference. So come and see means come and meet Jesus. Come and see him. And that's exactly what Philip does. He says, come and see. And then he brings Nathanael to the Savior. Now let's pick it back up. Verse 47, we got a couple of verses we're gonna read here. This is about to get really good, guys. John 1 says, when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me, Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And so of Nathanael, when Jesus says, this is a man of no deceit, what he's saying is, this is a straightforward man. This is a man with no hidden motives. This is, a, this is a claim on his character. This is who he is as a person. This is something deep. This is something that, that you don't pick up from just looking at the outside. It's, it's something that only Jesus sees because he sees the inside. And this blows Nathaniel away. He, he responds and he says, how do you know me? And then we get this incredible response from Jesus where he just says so plainly, I saw you. I saw you. Guys, because Jesus is God, he sees you right where you are today. He sees you. Let me ask you a few questions. Let's get real. Do you feel unseen? This year, have you felt unseen? Are you in a season of life where the, the, the demands of work, the demands of family, the pressures of life, maybe trials and tragedy and crisis just continue to pour on in such a way that you feel like no one sees you. I don't know the details of your story, but I know that this is a situation that happens oh so often. And Jesus puts on display a little flex of his power when he says, Nathaniel, I saw you even before Philip got there because I have the power to see you. Guys, that's, that's part of the message today. That's a huge part of this passage that God wants you to hear. He sees you. This is not just preacher talk, okay? Like I'm being very serious. He sees you. He knows you. He can save you, and he can sustain you. As I was thinking about the impact of, of that truth this week, I was reflecting on a, something that happened in our family uh, a couple of years ago. This is a, a, light, a light-hearted story, but a couple of years ago, we had the opportunity to go on vacation and uh, you know, get out of town for a couple of days, which is a good thing, right? And so we went to Dallas, and we were, we were at a water park. Now, at this time... There was only four of us in total because Chelsea had not been born, uh, which means, you know, everybody was a little bit younger. My oldest was very, very good in the water and very adventurous, always wanting to go full throttle. It's kind of her thing. My youngest was like super scared of the water and she didn't have the skills to back it up either. So that kind of made her very, very hesitant. My wife is a great swimmer as well, but she was great with child. So Chelsea was on her way. <laughs> And so at this park, um, we were kind of resting. The only thing that was really holding Hannah back, that's my oldest, was the fact that I needed to, to watch her sister and, you know, try to take care of the mom and all these different things. And so we, we had a moment to rest, you know, kind of by this pool, and there was like this little island thing out here, and she wanted to go swim. And so I told her, I said, that's fine. Here's the rules. At all times, I just need you to make sure that you can see me. I said, you can swim out there, have a great time, live life to the fullest, right? Amen, amen. <laughs> But make sure you can see me at all times. Because if you can see me, I can see you. And if I can see you, no matter what comes, if I switch this into a wave pool or if a bunch of 
I don't know, teenagers pop in the pool. I'm not being mean about teenagers. I'm just saying, you know. Like, well, no matter what happens, if I can see you, I could save you. I can get to you. And I was thinking about that story because this is the same truth that God wants to speak to your heart today. Our Heavenly Father is so much greater than any picture of an earthly father. Your Heavenly Father can see you. There's no place where you can go where He can't see you. There's no place where you could hide from Him. There's no circumstances that could cloud your life in such a way that He's trying to figure out where you are. He really truly sees you. And because He sees you, there's not a moment of your life where He can't step in and save you. There's not a moment of your life where He can't step in and sustain you because He is a good Father. And Jesus showcases that. He tells him, he said, man, I, I see you. Boy, I hope that you hear that today. I hope you feel the weight of that truth today. That no matter the details, that situation that you've not told anybody about, he sees you. He can save you. And he can sustain you. When Nathaniel heard that, his response was just total belief. He, he went all in. That was it for Nathaniel. He, he, he's a part of the team. And we know that because in verse 49, he says a couple of things about Jesus that have huge messianic implications. After being skeptical, after thinking, I don't know what this guy's talking about, he says, you're the Messiah, you are the, the King of Israel, the Son of God. Boy, I hope that that same type of confident belief can be instilled in every heart who's gathered here today. Now look at the next two verses, because this is how Jesus responds. He says, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So it's a fascinating couple of verses. Let's talk about it. Where it says greater things, I want you to grab a hold of that. That's an important. What greater things is he talking about? He, he says, hey man, I just told you I saw you. You're going to see greater things. Well, what the disciples at that time had to wait on, we have the great benefit of looking back on and knowing that what Jesus is talking about, he's, he's talking about his trip to the cross. The perfect life that he would live that would lead him to die, the sacrificial death that he died, and then ultimately the, the victorious resurrection that he accomplished. He forever defeated sin and death. The grave no longer has any power. Sin's penalty has been paid for. Now there is possible a, a means, a way for sinners like me, for those who fall woefully short to stand before God forgiven and redeemed. Because there's no greater thing that's ever happened. When Jesus says, you're going to see greater things, he was saying, listen, I'm here to rescue and redeem. And when I, they, they, they would get it. The disciples, they would get it, but only after the cross. We have the great benefit of looking now and, and realizing that what God did through his son Jesus on the cross changes everything. And now there is possible this great, great, great news that you can, no matter who you are, come to God, repent of sin, place your faith in him, and he'll make you new. He will do what only he can do. Guys, that is the best news. That is the greatest thing that's ever happened. And it comes with an invitation. Jesus says, it's for you. Now, I want to be sure that we finish this passage. So the, the last part of 51 was an interesting phrase, right? Now, I want you to look at your Bible, where it talks about angels ascending and descending. Do you see that? I hope that you have a Bible that, that gives you some sort of help there, maybe a little note or a cross-reference or something. Look at it. I hope that, that, that something helps you realize that, that this is actually a reach back, an allusion to Genesis chapter 28. Now, Genesis 28 is about Jacob's dream. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as Jacob's ladder. Are you familiar with this phrase, that, that term? Yeah, Jacob's ladder. This is a story of Jacob feeling isolated and alone, feeling abandoned. And God meets his needs. God provides for him. It's a fascinating chapter. And God sends angels to both guard him and guide him. 
And then he gets to see what is referred to as Jacob's ladder. And it's, it's this link between heaven and earth. And Jesus puts it in here knowing that this, that this Jewish audience would be able to recognize the significance of that. In Genesis 28, Jacob names the place Bethel, which means house of God, because that's where God revealed himself to Jacob. And Jesus is standing and saying, listen, guys, in that passage, in that Old Testament story, there was a place where heaven met earth. Now there's a person where heaven meets earth. This is now fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now the way to the Father, and that's how John would later write it in John 14, 6, that no one comes to the Father except through Jesus, the Son. He's saying now this is no longer about a destination or a place. It's about a person. Your hope is now standing before you, and his name is Jesus. And this leads us to the value that we believe in, relational evangelism. This is what guides our steps. This is what motivates the decisions we make. This is what, what orders our prayers. We must be about sharing this good news. And so, very briefly, but stay with me. I want to talk about evangelism. I don't want to talk about that word relational. We're going to look at them both, okay? Here is a simple definition of evangelism. I hope it is helpful. It is not comprehensive, but, but, but I'm hoping that this can, can be an encouragement to you. Evangelism is teaching the gospel with the aim to persuade. Like fundamentally, that's what it is. So let's think about that. The first thing is teaching. We have to teach the gospel. We have to use words. We have to be clear. We have to speak. We have to teach the truth about what? About what the Bible says our greatest need is. About what the Bible says about the nature and character of God about the sufficiency of Christ, about his provision, about our need to respond in faith. We have to teach that. And if you're, if you're worried about that, listen, if you're getting hung up on that, you're thinking, well, I could never like do something. Yeah. Listen, you teach all the time, all the time. Anytime you've ever invited someone to come over to your house and given them directions, you're teaching. You know, you gotta go down here and take a left, you know, stick around, you're teaching. Any time that you are in a discussion and you're trying to convince somebody why your favorite restaurant is the best, like you're teaching, like, like any time there's something that you know, something that you have a working knowledge of, that you want to be helpful and encourage and impart to someone else, that's teaching. What I'm trying to say is don't overcomplicate that part of it. Just don't underestimate its importance because, because people's lives are transformed when they are taught the gospel. Now, the gospel is a word that is deserving of, of definition over and over and over again. It's, a, it's a, church, a word we use in the church, but gospel means good news. And that's what it is. It is the good news of what God has done that we could not have done. That through the sending of his son, through the perfect life of Jesus, through the sacrificial death of Jesus, and through the victorious resurrection of Jesus, now there is a way for our sin to be forgiven. The penalty has been paid. Righteousness is possible if we will join Christ, if we will repent of sin and make him our Lord and our King. Listen, that's the good news that anybody can come to him, that he's paid the price and he wants you to be a part of his family, but it only happens through Jesus Christ. So we teach the gospel with the aim to persuade. Don't get tripped up on that word either. It's important. Persuade is important because we must never lose sight of, we must remember that every person that we interact with is either walking in the light or they are trapped in darkness. And so when we interact with people, it is our desire to showcase what it means to come into a saving relationship and knowledge of Jesus Christ. We, we do our best with this. We're motivated with this because of the reality that a person locked in sin and death, that Jesus is the only way out. And if they don't respond with faith, then they're on a path that leads to eternal destruction every time. And so that makes us live with urgency. That makes us never forget that we want to bring people to a moment of conversion where they would give their life to Christ, 
where they would be changed forever. Now, that does not mean that we reduce people to projects, but it does mean that every time that we open up our lives, that our hope is that this person would respond in faith. Persuade is an intentional word, never manipulate. That's not the word that we use. Because if I can talk you into something, someone else can talk you out of it. So that's not what we're after. That's not the game that we're in. We are meant to be persuasive. We're meant to showcase what Christ has done and let people know it's made a difference for me. This is the great commission to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Not the great suggestion. So what do we mean by relational evangelism? What do we mean by that? Maybe you've heard that phrase before, maybe you're not. Let me just give you a a couple of guiding thoughts and framework that you have to remember. Relational is an important word, but it in no way lowers the bar. It actually only raises it. You see, the fear and the temptation is that you would hear these words to, to practice relational evangelism and think, well, I'm only responsible for those people I know. <laughs> and so if I don't know your name, then best of luck to you. <laughs> no. We're called to share the gospel each and every time the opportunity is there to live our life ready and willing to go and to share everywhere we go. We say relational evangelism because we want to drive home the point that this is actually a part of discipleship, that we care about people, that it's our desire to walk with people before they come to Christ, at the moment they come to Christ, and then again after they come to Christ, so that we see them saved, but then also grow in the faith, so that they might experience salvation and sanctification. We do this so that we can never forget that we're called to care about people in such a way that we, that we take responsibility And whether that's here or whether that's at another church, our prayer is that God through the Spirit would use the whole body of Christ to bring people in and raise them up and teach them so that they might grow. Because this is the value, relational evangelism, so that we might never lose sight that that we have the most beautiful message the world has ever seen the most urgent message the world has ever seen and the biggest message the world has ever seen. We have the hope that comes from knowing Christ and there's a hope far too great for us to try to keep it right here. It's something that we must live out. And so we say we value relational evangelism. That's our hope is that we would be a people committed to being disciples who make disciples. Church, this is our calling. This is both who we are, but it's also how we're supposed to live. And so my hope for today is this, is that if you are a Christ follower, that you will leave this place fired up and motivated and ready to live out the mission of God. And if you're not a Christ follower, my hope is that you would come to saving faith is that you would come down here to the front, meet with me, or, or go by the hospitality room in a second, talk to somebody, talk to those people around you. We've got Sunday school teachers in this room and all sorts of leaders in the church. Talk to somebody who can share with you what it means to place your faith in Jesus. Because that's the greatest thing that you could ever do. That's the answer to your greatest need, sin. And Christ has already paid for it. And so if you're here in the room today and you've never responded in faith, that is our prayer, is that we would be able to count you as a part of the family, not because of anything you've done, but because of what Christ has done for us. And so let us help you take that next step of faith. If you're here and you need to get baptized, maybe you're ready to join the church, anything like that. Listen, I believe that God has a desire for every single one of us as a result of hearing his word preached to move us deeper to send us out and to to embolden us all to take a next step of faith. What I'm trying to say is whatever your next step is, you don't have to take it alone. We would love to walk with you. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to do our best to try to encourage and equip you to follow Jesus faithfully. So I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to respond. We always respond with a, a time of worship, a time of praise. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would use this to speak very clearly directly to your heart. 
Father, thank you for loving us and thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would mold us and make us and shape us into a missionary force for your glory and for the good of all people. Father, we love you. This is for you. This is because of you. And so, Father, we give our breath back to you through praise. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.